Testing, testing, testing. Those on the live stream, uh, the reason why we're, we're just waiting at the moment, it's um, the service time was, was set for 3.45, so we're five minutes early at the moment. So I believe the service will start in five minutes. For those who have um, joined us and saw the service at the crematorium, the, um, the, the, the streaming ended just at the very end of the service. I thought it was still continuing, and I uh, thought I was, I was running it all the way to here, um, but I didn't realise, because I was busy obviously filming and things, that it had actually ended. So that's fine. I've started the second link, which hopefully you will have found, of course, and that's on at the moment. I can see there's three people, I think I'm one of those, there's three people who are on the link at the moment, so I would hope that more people would find us soon. If you know people who are struggling, you just ask them to search for the link which is JSPV and then look for a picture of Bill when he was younger and it will say live on the image as well because that's exactly what's happening it's live streaming that's the artwork I, I pre-loaded and then when the live streaming starts on that link it comes up with the word live superimposed so we are live streaming and I'm watching that on my phone at the moment so I know it's working and also the signal was very weak at the crematorium. It's much better here at the church, so I've upped the quality, so we now have better quality. A level that I would normally, normally stream at, so that's very good.
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for in his great mercy by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, he gave us new birth into a living hope, the hope of an inheritance reserved in heaven for you, which nothing can destroy or spoil or wither. Welcome to this service of thanksgiving for the life of our dear friend Bill. Uh, we uh, will remember his life during this service and give thanks for all that he did and all that he meant to so many people. The close of the service, uh, the family invite everybody to join them at the Boot Inn on Rectory Road where there will be refreshments served and you will be able to share some of your own personal memories of Bill with the family. But let us pray. Blessed are you, sovereign God, ruler and judge of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of this age that is passing away, may the glory of your kingdom, which the saints enjoy, surround our steps as we journey on. May we reflect the light of your glory this day, and so be made ready to come into your presence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Blessed be God forever. Amen. We now have our readings from Scripture. First is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8, and then a reading from St. John's Gospel. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and then verses 37 to 39. Who can then separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger? or poverty, or danger, or death? No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us, for I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then from St. John we hear these words. From John chapter 14, verses 27 to 28. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am leaving, but I will come back to you. If you love me, you will be glad that I am going to the Father, for he is greater than I. Thanks be to God for his word. It's lovely to be able to join together on this afternoon to be able to say our farewells to Bill. The family will be uh, sharing some of their memories and, uh, and words which are important to them at this time. But we recognise that in all things, Bill was a Christian man. He was a member of this church for many, many years. And... Uh, with his wife Joy, uh, served in so many different ways. But the thing I perhaps most remember uh, about Bill was his welcome. Uh, even when he'd given up most uh, roles within the church, you would often find him at the door on a Sunday morning, or particularly on a Friday when Friday Friends, our dementia group, was meeting. Bill was always there to welcome people with his usual smile. That is important, love and welcome. 
On the odd occasions that I was able to visit Bill and join their home, the same was true. There was always a welcome. A welcome as they invited you in. A welcome as they provided you with tea and biscuits. A welcome in so many different ways. Of course, there is sadness now at Bill's passing, but also there is a sense of joy because Bill is now welcomed into heaven. He is welcomed amongst the saints and perhaps more importantly, he is welcomed back into relationships with people who have gone before him. In particular, uh, we also remember his wife of many, many years, Joy, and we give thanks that they are now reunited once again very much a welcoming couple uh, to all who knew them. We have heard in scripture of how, although we perhaps are saddened by people's passing, we recognise that uh, that sense of loss is, is not a permanent sense of loss. That as uh, Jesus told his disciples, uh, do not be afraid and let peace fill your hearts. And so today there is a sense of peace. The sense of peace that for Bill, the trial and suffering of... of Bill that we lost in the recent years are, are now back again. And that uh, he's whole and complete with joy and with his saviour in heaven. The Bible tells us that... As followers of Jesus Christ, we have a sure hope and confidence in the future. And we hold that confidence now with Bill, that he is happy and complete and united with all who have gone before him. For us, of course, there is sadness at his loss uh, and that sense of an empty space uh, around the table in our lives. This Christmas uh, season is, well, every Christmas season is always uh, uh, highlighted by the, the, the lights that we see. We've put the Christmas tree lights on. I'm sure Bill would have appreciated that uh, uh, today. We light candles for our carol services. And we remember that, uh, the, that our memories of Bill are like a candle flame that burns brightly. And while ever that, that flame burns, it, the darkness of grief will not overcome us. So, yes, today there, there is sadness, there are tears, as we remember Bill and all the happy times that we shared with him. But there's uh, also, uh, as we move forward from this day, a time to remember and reflect, so that our tears will be replaced with smiles, smiles with laughter, as we remember all those happy times that we shared with Bill. But for now we say goodbye and thank you. We say thank you to God for giving us such a special person in Bill. But we also say a big thank you to Bill for the way that he shared his life and his love for life with so many people. Amen. We're going to stand and sing uh, the hymn chosen uh, for this occasion on the order of service. It's uh, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching As To War.
someone who was so full of life in his prime and had such a presence that it is hard to think that he is no longer here. Although he declined in the last few years of his life and dementia slowly attacks his intelligence and his personality, there are always traces of the old Bill. The carers who looked after him at first at home and then at Bowbrook Care Home in Fradley said he was lovely and they adored him as he was such a gentleman, had a good sense of humour and a charming smile. He showed great delight on hearing that his team, Nottingham Forest, had won. A year ago, despite having become very quiet and not responding to old photos that were shown to him, when his best friend, Vin's daughter Jane, came to visit, he recognised Vin from one such photo and said, he was my best friend and I loved him. Dad, usually known as Bill, grew up in a terraced house in West Bridgeford, Nottingham, close to Trent Bridge, handy for going to watch the football and the cricket he loved. His mum, Doris, was a devoted mother who nursed him through diphtheria, caught from a communal water fountain at the park. Dad enjoyed listening to stories of Robin Hood that his mother read. Once, he was cruelly whacked with a ruler on the palm of his hand by the head teacher as a punishment for being late to school when he had been kindly looking after his sick mother. Bill's father, George, became a foreman at the munitions factory and earned a medal from the Queen for his long service. Bill's brother, John, was born in 1937. The two brothers met up after lockdown last year and John was always in touch to check on Dad's health. He sadly died almost three months before Dad. The house where the family always lived had a dark, earthy-smelling cellar. One year, there were floods in Nottingham and the cellar had flooded. The electricity meter was on the far side of the cellar and the family needed to put some money in it so they could see. Dad was pushed out into the dark water in the tin bath as though it were a boat. <laughs> Unfortunately, the bath had a hole in it. <laughs> so it was sinking slowly as he went across. He was a hero, managing to put some coins in the meter before it sank. The family sheltered in the same cellar whenever there was an air raid on Nottingham during the Second World War. Bill was a good student who worked hard and after obtaining his school certificate at West Bridgeford Grammar School, went on to gain A-levels at night school, whilst working as a clerical officer for the Ministry of Works in Nottingham. In 1955, he passed the necessary exams with high marks to become a customs and excise officer, and he continued to serve as such throughout his career in different roles, including checking on breweries and betting duties, and working at, as administrative officer in VAT tribunals, rising to the elevated role of surveyor, as his office was on the 17th floor of Alpha Tower in 1974. Going back in time, in 1948, Bill started courting Mum, who was also a member of the youth club at Trent Boulevard Methodist Church. Bill began as a shy, awkward young man, but he was always lovable, Neither came from a religious family, but became committed Christians in 1951. They soon fell deeply in love and remained devoted to each other during their 65 years of marriage. Mum said it was a privilege to be his wife and to see how people respected him and his intelligence. They were engaged for six years before getting married in 1955 having saved up for their first home together at Wilford Hill. In 1958, Martin was born, and then in 1961, Rosalind. In 1962, Joy's own mother sadly died. Bill put pen to paper afterwards and wrote out his vow to love them 
and be thoughtful towards them as their grandma Taylor had done. We moved to Southern Coalfield in the bitter winter of 1962 because of Dad's job. Lorraine was born in 1966 and we were a happy family. A foster daughter, Jenny, lived with us for a time. Every other weekend or so, we would make a trip to Nottingham to visit the family. Dad did, did daft things at times, for fun, or to show off. <laughs> Once, Dad took a sledging at Sutton Park. We all three of us sat crowded on the sledge, ready to go, and noticed a big bump in the ground about halfway down the white hill sloping down in front of us. We told him to avoid it, but Dad mischievously gave us a push the wrong way, and a few seconds later we all three ended upside down or thrown off, wailing. <laughs> On bonfire night, Martin so soon took over the lighting of the fireworks in the garden, as he was far more sensible than Dad. <laughs> he played tricks, such as making me think I'd caught a fish when I went fishing with him once. He'd somehow distracted me whilst he put the fish on the hook. I was also very excited when I found buried treasure in a cave at Tenby. Dad and Martin had, of course, buried some Victorian pennies there earlier. He threw young Lorraine over a stream on holiday in Norfolk for Dave Roper to catch, but she didn't quite make it and ended up on her back in the water. <laughs> He was always liable to leap up to head an imaginary football or bowl an imaginary cricket ball. He once fell flat on his face in the street and proceeded to perform a number of press-ups in an attempt to pass it off as normal behaviour. <laughs> we used to go on holiday with our friends, the Ropers, often to Mablethorpe or near Hunstanton, and had great fun together. Cricket and football were played on the beach. Dad was a strong swimmer and enjoyed swimming in the sea. We hoped nobody was looking when he got dressed afterwards, though, <laughs> as he was not very adept at holding up the towel. <laughs> Dad enjoyed a variety of music. He loved classical music, especially Beethoven and Mendelssohn, and his favourite music was Brooks' Violin Concerto. He loved Gilbert and Sullivan operettas, country and western music, Nana Muscuri, the Bee Gees, and Tina Turner. <laughs> he, loved Germ he loved German marching music embarrassingly. <laughs> we listened to music sometimes whilst eating, speeding up our eating as the music got more frenetic. <laughs> Dad used to enjoy singing and had a good, strong voice. Dad also loved reading and was a great storyteller. His captivating Billy Beetle stories were told at bedtime to us and then to his grandchildren. He liked telling amusing stories about work. Whilst interviewing a candidate for a job in customs and excise, talking about a dog licence, she was asked what she thought about a tax on cats. A tax on cats? I think it's terrible. Why would anyone want to hurt a cat? <laughs> Dad was saddened by the death of his mother on Christmas Day in 1982, followed by the death of his dear friend Finn in the following year. In 1984, Dad moved to Aldridge with her mum and Lorraine into a new bungalow, which was better for mum's mobility. And they made new friends there that continued to belong to South Parade. In 1986, Dad gained a certificate in European law, and in 1987, successfully applied for a post in Brussels, working on loan to the European Commission, investigating irregularities and fraud within the European Agricultural Fund, something quite astounding, as he had never ventured abroad before. He was well-respected well and liked at the Commission, a nickname Sir George. He was fluent in French, though spoke with an endearing English accent, and in 1990 earned praise from the Commission Secretary General for his speeches at training seminars in Athens 
to 200 customs and excise officers on fighting fraud in the EC. Mum and Dad thoroughly enjoyed living in Brussels. They made good friends there, went to the English church and enjoyed weekend excursions and having family to stay. Dad enjoyed the long lunches and Belgian beer too. He appeared on Belgian TV once whilst at the Festival of the Iris. He made everyone laugh as he said he thought it was the Festival of the Irish. <laughs> Dad didn't want to leave Brussels and was meant to stay for one more year. But Mum persuaded him to return to England so she could help when I had my first baby son, Robert. Dad was thinking that he might at last be able to get a dog if he came back. He said, when all the world's against you, they are always on your side. Dad always had a love of dogs, and dogs loved him. Dad applied for a position in London for his final year. However, his, his boss was a bully who had made other employees ill with stress. Dad was told to fire an employee who was struggling, but could not do so as this poor man's wife was dying of cancer, so he was reprimanded. Dad became severely depressed, having to retire a year early. Mum was incredibly selfless and supported him through this difficult time. Dad was prone to depression all his life after this, but fought it by helping others through voluntary work, by seeing family and friends, and being very, act very active in the life of the church. He had already been our caler at Cubs and senior leader at the Sunday school at South Parade, then later became a church steward and a communion steward. He helped at the church youth club, was treasurer for, ch um, for churches together, helped at soup and a roll, finally helping at Friday Friends for people with dementia, where he welcomed people at the door. He was even known bravely to dance in sketches for harvest suppers and the like, although he had two left feet. <laughs> On retiring, Dad trained in counselling and worked for victim, then bereavement support, and at the Fireside Centre in Birmingham for homeless people. He would readily give his coat or belt away if someone needed it. For many years, he sponsored a child to support his education through Action Aid. He helped colleagues or individuals at church who were struggling. He made the time to write long letters to friends and family, such as older cousin Marjorie, every Christmas time. People were important to him. The family loved getting together at the bungalow and for meals out, where Dad would always insist on paying for everybody. When they were still able, Mum and Dad enjoyed holidays abroad on their own or with members of the family, preferably somewhere sunny, not like here. <laughs> the couple enjoyed holidays with old friends Beryl and Bruce, Maureen and Janet and Brian Baines, mainly in the UK, and when they were able, visited Mum's brother Malcolm and wife Margot in Cornwall and other friends. Dad was always kind and generous and young at heart. Extraordinary and wonderful is how a friend of mine described him. He was. Now I invite uh, Bill's other daughter, Lorraine, who will lead us in the two poems uh, which are meaningful for the family. When I am dead, my dearest, by Christina Rossetti. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt, remember. And if thou wilt, forget. I shall not see the shadows. I shall not feel the rain. 
I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain, and dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set. Happily I may remember, and happily may forget. Success by Ralph Waldo Emerson. What is success? To laugh often and love much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affections of children, to earn the approbation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to give oneself, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. As we have heard, Bill had a, a great love for music and many different genres of music, which you will hear towards the end uh, of the service. But now we just sit quietly and reflect upon Bill's life as we listen to John Rutter's setting of Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd.
Bill's son, Martin, will now lead us in tribute to uh, Bill as he reads two more poems. Now, uh, the first poem is called Epitaph. It's by Merritt Malloy, and it seems to sum up a lot of Dad's philosophy. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and old men that wait to die. And if you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give to me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've known or loved. And if you cannot give me away, at least let me live on in your eyes and not your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love doesn't die, people do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. And the, the next one is uh, Crossing the Bar by Alfred Lord Tennyson, which is just a, has to be read at funerals, I think it's the law. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. We come now to a time of prayer, so let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the life and the witness of your church here on earth. For all those, like Bill, who gave so freely, so that the church's message might be seen and heard. Grant to us, who are still on our pilgrimage, that your Holy Spirit may lead us as we walk by faith in holiness and righteousness all of our days. We thank you for the love and care we receive in times of sorrow. Grant to all who mourn this day a sure confidence in your loving care. May they have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Holy God, we thank you for the love and fellowship that we shared with Bill. And so, God Almighty, we thank you that you have joined together your faithful people in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son. Give us grace to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those inexpressible joys which you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught his disciples, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now I'm going to invite some of Bill's grandchildren to reflect upon the life of their grandfather.
My granddad was a big part of my life from the day I was born. I spent many happy evenings after... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I spent many happy evenings after school <laughs> playing schools with him where he was good Mr White and naughty Mr Black. <laughs> when I went for sleepovers with Grandma and Grandad, he would tell me Billy Beetle stories and perhaps less appropriately for a child, read from 50 Greatest Disasters of the World. <laughs> Grandad and I always had a close bond. When I was <laughs> when I was stung by a wasp while on holiday, I only wanted Grandad. When I went to university, I wrote to Grandma and Grandad every week and will treasure their replies. There was always a story from Grandma about some silly thing Grandad had done, set on fire or broken. Although he was highly intelligent, he wasn't exactly the most practical. Jason and I once had to rescue them both when their car battery died at church because he'd managed to leave the lights on overnight. Another time, the fuse had tripped in the house, and they were both in awe when Jason went round and simply flipped it back for them. Jason and I visited Grandma and Grandad every Sunday and enjoyed ourselves so much listening to their stories that Grandma had to shoo us out of the house so that they could get some rest. Grandad would have done anything for his family, and indeed anyone else who needed help. He did more good than the vast majority of people in his lifetime, and the world is better because he was in it. He and Grandma were the absolute model humans, and it was a privilege to have them as my grandparents. <sighs> this one was written by my younger sister, Tabitha. My granddad was a wonderful man, and I adored him. He was so generous and kind. He was so full of life until dementia started to steal it from him. I saw him two days before he died, and he sat bolt upright on hearing my voice. I remember when he always got lost when going to the loo on family meals out. I used to have to stand guard in order to help him back to the table. He used to pick me up from school and like to nip to the pub pretending that I wanted a lemonade. Life was never dull with Grandad around. He always put others before himself and never acted selfishly. I will miss him so much but feel proud that he was my granddad. Hey, so uh, if you don't know me, I'm Bill's eldest grandson, Robert, um, and I had wanted to write a few words as, I, as I'd done for my grandma Joy, but I'll be honest, I simply found it too difficult to put into words, and so I went searching for a poem that encapsulated him, and I found one called The Happy Man, and I think it encapsulates him beautifully. <clears throat> when these graven lines you see, traveller, do not pity me, though I be among the dead, let no mournful word be said. Children that I leave behind, and their children, all were kind. Near to them, and to my wife, I was happy all my life. My three children I brought up right, and their children I rocked at night. Death nor sorrow never brought cause for one unhappy thought. Now, and with no need of tears, here they leave me full of years. Leave me to my quiet rest in the region of the blessed. So we join together again in singing the hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, remain with you always. Amen.
Thank you for watching the live stream. This now concludes the live streaming service. So the live streaming service will end very shortly. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.